Hi, I'm Tom O'Brien, and this is History 3375, the CIA and the Third World. I want to welcome all of you to the class, and I particularly want to uh, speak to the students that we have out on the distance ed sites right now. Uh, you probably don't have a syllabus. And what you can do, and this is just for this live class as we're teaching it now, if you will email me at tobrien at uh.edu, that's tobrien at uh.edu, I'll shoot you a syllabus, okay? Just email me and I'll send it as an attachment. You'll have it as soon as I hear from you. So that's my email address and that's how to get it, okay? Because it is not posted on a website at this point. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the class. What I want to do is talk about the class itself, what we're trying to accomplish, a little bit about the development of the course and the requirements in the first half, the kind of boring stuff that you don't want to hear about. And then in the second half, we'll get into some of the root material of the course itself. To begin with, uh, this course I first taught some 20 years ago as CIA in Latin America. And then after a couple of years, expanded it and to the CIA in the third world, which is the basic scope that it has now. And we put it on tape, as we're doing again now, about eight years ago. Given the time that's elapsed, it's particularly appropriate now, given recent events, to go back and redo this. So this is the reason, and if you've seen this before on television, you'll find that, yes, a core of the course remains the same. A good 50 to 60 percent remains the same, because a lot of it's about the history of the third world, the history of the CIA, and those facts don't change. We can alter our interpretations, but some of it is going to remain very much the same. On the other hand, a substantial part of the course has been altered to bring it up to date. One of the things that we've done is I've gone back, and particularly with the CIA interventions, which constitute about half the course, looking at CIA interventions in various countries, what we've done is update those. We know a lot more about many of these cases than we did 10 years ago when I was teaching this. For example, with the Congo, we're going to redo that case and when I originally taught the course on television, we didn't know who was specifically responsible for the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. We now know. That becomes part of the database that we use for the course. And you'll see similar updates from most of the interventions themselves. The second thing is that, of course, over the course of the decade, the CIA itself has extended its history, and we're going to go over that new material as well, what has happened to the Central Intelligence Agency over the last decade. And then most importantly, of course, is the history of what's happened since 9-11 and the role of the CIA. Those events, of course, have had a shattering impact on this country and upon the Central Intelligence Agency itself. Now, in some ways, that last segment of the course, which you'll see on the syllabus is simply called the Age of Terror, varies significantly from most of the cases that we look at. Most of the cases I'm going to look at during the course look at a third world country and what the CIA did to overthrow a government in that country, why it happened, how it happened, why was it successful, etc. That is the bulk of the second half of the course. The age of terror differs, of course, because we're dealing with uh, issues of terror organizations like Al-Qaeda, where did they come from, but still it is very much rooted in some basic elements of the course itself. For example, one of the key issues involving 9-11 is why didn't we know more? Why weren't we alerted by the CIA? Not to a specific attack such as occurred in Manhattan or in Washington, D.C., because that kind of information is almost never discernible by intelligence agencies, no matter what we like to think. But why wasn't there a greater, or why didn't there appear to be a greater awareness of this threat? This is one of the issues that runs through the history of the Central Intelligence Agency, because as we will see, there have always been questions about the effectiveness of the agency in terms of carrying out that particular mission of gathering and analyzing intelligence information from overseas. So that's already a theme in the course, and it plugs directly into looking at the age of terror. Another critical issue is that, indeed, there are connections between al-Qaeda and other organizations, and the activities of the CIA during one of its largest covert operations in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Many of the people today who are parts of various terrorist groups today 
were part of the effort to oust Soviet invaders from Afghanistan during the 1980s, and the Central Intelligence Agency played a key role in assisting those groups. The question is, does that make them liable in any way for what happened in 9-11? Or are the two issues largely separated? We have to look at that. Is this a case of what they call blowback, where the agency gets involved in an overseas operation that then has negative consequences for the United States somewhere down the road? We need to explore exactly what did happen in Afghanistan, what were the connections or lack of them. And there are other issues that run through the course that you will see played out as we deal with the age of terror. But that one is the largest of the modifications of the course from its original form as we shot it maybe eight years ago. So you will see changes if you've been familiar with, if you've seen parts of this before or heard about the course, you will see those kinds of changes taking place as I teach through. But the core of the course will remain the same. And what I want to talk about for a few minutes has to do with what are the major objectives of the course? What are we trying to accomplish here? Now, one qualification when I start, a technical qualification. Normally, uh, what we've had is an overhead. So I have a series of outline points that you can work off of. Uh, because of the new studio, we don't have the overhead. But as of next week, I'll just bring in the PowerPoint disk, and we'll be doing it on a PowerPoint. So you will see that if you have seen the TV courses that I've done before. And I used to, well, there's these outline points that he talks to, so I can copy those down. And you look at this and say, you know, what happened? That's because there is no overhead right now. What we will do instead is next week, I'll simply bring in the PowerPoint disk, and we'll put up the same outline points on PowerPoint. And that eliminates the problem of you having to worry about, can I spell that name? You know, what was that last statement that he made? The, those outline points provide an outline of the major comments that I'm making and make it easier for you to pay attention to the lecture, because you don't have to worry as much about taking down specific notes or are you copying something correctly? Did you get that name right? And it saves me having to spell names like, you know, Osama bin Laden. Uh, you can spell them for yourself because you'll see them on the overhead. But that will be doing next week. It won't be a major problem for this week because what I'm covering is pretty rudimentary. What are the basic requirements of the course, objectives, and then we're going to talk about the third world as a background concept, uh, the overall history of the third world in the second half of class today. So you're not going to have a major problem with this, and starting next week, we will have the PowerPoint outline available to you that will be up on the screens for everyone to see. As far as the objectives go, first of all, one of the things we have to do, and one of the things we're going to do today, is talk about the history of the third world. You can't really understand what the CIA does and what it tries to accomplish in its overseas ventures unless you have some idea of the history of the third world itself, have some grasp of the characteristics of third world societies. We're going to be talking about countries in Latin America, Africa, Asia, the Middle East. And what we're going to do in the second half today is try to get a sort of basic grasp, nothing too in-depth, because what can we do in 75 minutes? We're talking about 80% you know, of the world's peoples. Not a lot, but we can try to get a grasp on some of the major characteristics of third world countries, their historical development, their cultures and societies, and use that as a background. During the course, as we move along into later sections and talk about interventions, each week that I'm talking about an intervention, we'll also talk about the individual history of the specific third world country where that intervention is taking place, whether it's Cuba, Vietnam, etc. So you'll get both a general background today and then a specific historical background for each country as we get into the individual interventions. You need that kind of information. And one of the things the course accomplishes is to give you some sense of the general characteristics of third world societies. That's essential to the course itself, but it's also important for you to take away that as part of the knowledge base of the course. The second thing we're going to look at, in fact, next week, is U.S. foreign policy. Not in the usual boring, dull way that <laughs> you've been accustomed to if you've ever had a course in diplomatic history or had to listen to somebody talk about it. And we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about treaties and, you know, who signed this treaty and when was it. And 
but instead, what are the kinds of things that have driven the United States over the last couple of centuries? How do we view the rest of the world? What kinds of things are we trying to accomplish as we interact with the rest of the globe? And that is indicated not only by traditional diplomatic methods, but by a variety of other interactions, military interventions, covert operations, business investments, uh, the spread of American popular culture around the world. All of these are ways that we interact with societies beyond our own borders. We want to look at that variety. We want to see what was the US trying to accomplish? What was its perception of other societies? So we can better understand what the role of the CIA is in this process. Now, the CIA is often described as this sort of rogue institution, an agency that's out of control that goes off and carries out interventions uh, without getting proper approval. All of that's baloney, OK? Uh, that is a convenient explanation uh, grabbed onto by American politicians when they don't want to take the blame when things go badly, OK? It's called plausible deniability. Presidents have been particularly prone to use it. Uh, you know, that, yes, they are trying to overthrow government X, but if somebody finds out about it and it gets messy, you say, well, I didn't know what these people are doing. You know, I told them, or we try to assassinate somebody. And they say, well, I told them to deal with the problem. I didn't tell them to go kill anybody. That's right. <laughs> but everyone knows who works with the CIA, uh, the National Security Council, et cetera. When the president comes in and says, you need to take care of this guy, they don't mean extend his medical plan. You know what they're intending. Okay? So uh, we need to understand what U.S. foreign policy was because the CIA is an element in U.S. foreign policy. Things are being done because it fits the desires of the U.S. government to accomplish certain goals. So if we know what those policies are, what the U.S. is trying to accomplish, then you better understand what the CIA is doing because they aren't a bunch of people who are running off just doing things on their own. They're very much a part of the foreign policy establishment as much as any diplomat, as much as any general, as much as any foreign aid officer. They're part of the same process and they don't go off and do it on their own. They're part of a very conscious set of decisions about how we're going to interact with other societies. The third objective is to look at the history of U.S. intelligence to go back over the last 200 years, the time of American independence, all the way down to the present, and examine the evolution of intelligence agencies and intelligence activity in the United States, all the way back to George Washington, you know, and looking at Nathan Hale, the famous spy who got caught, who was not a very good spy, by the way. Uh, and I'll explain why when we get to that, because if you get caught, you're not very good. Um, you're not very helpful either, once they hang you. Uh, we're going to look at that part of intelligence operations, and then, of course, come down and look at the last 60 years or so, which have been primarily influenced by the Central Intelligence Agency, and look at the history of the agency itself. And we're going to look at two particular aspects of agency history. One, we're going to look at the kinds of things that the agency, as we will see, was originally designed to do, which is gathering intelligence information and analyzing it. And what are the kinds of factors that influence that analysis? This is going to bring up issues because, as we will see, the recent debate and argument over weapons of mass destruction in Iraq is not entirely new. These controversies have arisen before, not in such a spectacular manner, but they have arisen before over the agency's ability to clearly analyze and predict what may happen or what is happening overseas at a given moment. The second part of the agency's operations that we're going to look at, because it's the main focus of the course, is covert operations, specifically interventions in third world countries. What has driven this? What has been the experience of the agency? How did the agency wind up focused so heavily on covert operations through the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, for four decades of its history? This was really the central focus of what the agency was doing. And yet, as we will see, it was really designed to be an intelligence gathering agency, not a covert operations agency. How did it get to be what it is? And why is that the case? Now, again, this is not 
what you'd call a complete history of the CIA. Now, it's not a thoroughgoing institutional history. We're going to leave out a lot along the way because this is meant as background to help you understand in what context the agency is doing the variety of things that it does uh, over the course of its history from 1947 down to the present. So it has, if you will, uh, a distorted element to it because our main focus is going to be on covert operations and particularly in the third world. We could well argue that First of all, intelligence analysis has taken up a fair amount, but not most of the time of the agency. And secondly, the agency has often focused on countries that we would not consider third world, specifically the Soviet Union. But we're going to leave that part aside because we really don't have time, given the focus of the course, to be entertaining a discussion of their interactions with the Soviets, except on a very limited basis as it affects their interest in third world countries. The other major objective is to look at, of course, the CIA interventions themselves. And the second half of the course, particularly as you look at the syllabus, you will see that we go down from one intervention after another, from Iran to Guatemala, and we'll look at the Congo, Cuba, etc. That is really the bulk of the second half of the course. And as I said, even when you get to the age of terror, we're going to begin that discussion by looking at CIA intervention specifically in Afghanistan and to what extent are there ties between what happened in Afghanistan with the CIA and what we'll call the Mujahideen. What were the links between the U.S. and these Muslim fighters in Afghanistan and are there connections between that happening and later events? So even there we're going to start essentially with an intervention to look at the age of terror. And that is one of the key objectives of the course for you to understand why does the U.S. intervene? How does it intervene? Why do these things succeed or fail? What are the ultimate outcomes of what the United States does through the Central Intelligence Agency? Finally, the overall objective is to give you a better sense of how the U.S. has interacted with the third world over the past 60 odd years. And that is really the central focus. When you put all these pieces together, once you've looked at the history of the third world, once you've looked at things like U.S. foreign policy, looked at the history of the agency and the specific interventions, we should have a fairly clear picture that on the one hand, yes, it's interesting in and of itself to learn about the CIA and these interventions. But what it's also meant to do is to give you a better sense in the end how have we interacted with much of the world's population, with this diversity of societies and cultures that lie around us? Now, again, this is only part of the picture because we interact, as I suggested earlier, when we're talking about U.S. foreign policy with third world countries and the world as a whole in a variety of ways, diplomacy, economic missions, business investment, popular culture, but an important part of how we interact, particularly in crisis situations, is through the Central Intelligence Agency. So it gives you, the agency sort of serves as a prism through which you can view U.S. interaction with the third world. It becomes an instrument to help us better understand how we interact with third world countries and how they react to us. Again, it's a slice of the pie, but it's an interesting perspective as well particularly in crisis situations, to see how the U.S. has responded in those situations. And when you look back at the objectives I've just talked about and then look at the syllabus, you'll see there's a close connection. Today we're talking about third world history, then we're going to go on and talk about U.S. foreign policy, then we'll talk about the history of intelligence operations and specifically the CIA, then talk about the interventions. The logic of the syllabus is the logic of the series of objectives I just gave you. The two are closely connected. And now, as I turn to talking about questions of exams and how to prepare for them and what's required of you, et cetera, the same idea should be kept in mind, that there's a close connection between what you're going to see and hear about and how it's structured and getting ready for the exams. Okay? I logically build from what I'm telling you in class, what the major points are that I'm giving you, and what you're going to be asked on exams. So there shouldn't be a lot of surprises. Now, to get through, you know, what are the nuts and bolts? First of all, let me go back to a technical point, again, that this is being taped, 
and outside of the people here right now and the people in the off-campus locations, everybody else that watches this over the next few years is going to be seeing it on tape. The important thing to remember is that anything that I say, and I will try to keep the comments on exams and other requirements. Uh, that's fine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You'll have to wait. Uh, we're picking up now. Anything I say, okay, on the tape is fine, but if the syllabus <laughs> disagrees, you go by the syllabus, okay? The syllabus is always right, unless I made a blunder <laughs> writing up the syllabus, which sometimes happens. But essentially, if I say something over the next 40 minutes or whatever, about exams, reading assignments, and then you look at the syllabus and you're watching this on a tape or a DVD, know that the syllabus is correct. Okay? The syllabus is the latest iteration. We can't go back and change tape by tape year after year. But one thing I can do is change reading assignments, change uh, exams, and they have been modified over the years since I did the original tape and probably will be modified again over the next couple of years. So if you are watching this as a DVD or tape, just realize that the syllabus is always the most recent iteration of the course's requirements, and what it says there is accurate. Okay, the syllabus is accurate. It may disagree with the tape. If it does, go by the syllabus. All right. First of all, the major requirement, the major grading instrument, consists of two exams, two essay exams. Now, I'm not going to get into how many questions, et cetera. You can read it on the syllabus because I might change it, <laughs> confusing people. But the basic format, this hasn't changed since I started teaching this course or any other course in terms of undergraduate courses. It, there'll be essay exams. Okay? And you will have to answer an essay question or questions, depending on what the syllabus tells you. That will be 80% of your grade. Okay? So, if you count 100 points towards a straight A, 80 of those points will come out of those two essay-type exams. Second thing that you need to be concerned with are reading assignments. Now, again, I'm not going to go into detail and say, well, you'll read this book or that because it may change. What's on the syllabus will be accurate. In terms of those reading assignments, they constitute the second most important part of the course next to the lectures. The lectures are the key. I mean, they're the guide for you to help you through the material, give it logical structure, etc. But an important supplement are the readings to give you background or further insight. You know, we may be talking about the history of a country or a culture, we may be talking about an intervention, and I get to spend maybe 15 minutes on it, and you don't get a lot but I can supplement that with additional readings, and that's the purpose of those materials, is to supplement what you're getting in the course, enrich it. The other part of your requirements in terms of actual grading instruments will be short essays and identifications that are outlined and explained in the syllabus. That's the other 20 points. As far as the total composition. That means that you've got 80 points on two exams, straight essay, and then homework assignments that you'll turn in according to the syllabus. They'll tell you when, so forth. That's the other 20 points. There are several purposes for having the reading assignment. One is to be sure that you are doing the reading, to let us know that you're making the effort 
to supplement what's in the lectures with the reading assignments. Second purpose is to assist you as well in terms of some people, all right, don't do great on essays. They're just not great at writing an essay. All right, that may be the case. But with the homework assignments, you've got a tremendous amount of time to focus on some very simple writing assignments, and you can supplement your grade and assist yourself by doing those and taking the time that's necessary to get those completed. There's nothing that is unusually challenging in these assignments. They're basically ways of asking you, did you read the material? Did you take out some of the basic information from the material? Those are the major requirements. Now, the big key is how do we grade the exams, or how are the exams graded? Again, I've used the same system for years, not just in this course, but every course that I've taught that's an undergraduate course. So if you've taken a course with me before, you can fall asleep for five minutes, uh, since you've already heard this. 40% of your grade on the exams will be based on the analytical quality of the answer. And what that means, quite simply, is that the questions that are asked are always of one or two types. Either we're asking you how and why things happened, or the question is a comparative question. For example, comparative question. Compare the U.S. interventions in Chile and Nicaragua in terms of uh, what motivated the U.S., what tactics were used, why the operation succeeded or failed, you know, what the ultimate outcome was in terms of the effects on these countries, something like that. Now, if you answer the question and say, well, this is what happened in Chile and here's what happened in Nicaragua, that's fine, but that's not comparative. You're not telling me, well, you know, the U.S. motivation is very different. Here it was strategic issues. Over there it was economic issues. Uh, the tactics were very different. One's a paramilitary operation. One was a largely political operation. Now it's comparative. Now you're actually showing me similarities or differences between the two interventions. The same goes for questions that ask how and why. If we ask you, well, explain the factors that led to the decline of the power and influence of the CIA uh, from the time of the Vietnam War down to 2001. You could write a great history of the CIA, okay, from let's say 1970, or 1965, from the start of US military, major military operations in Vietnam, from 65 down to the present. Very detailed, you know, here's all the directors of Central Intelligence. Uh, I can't remember all their names, so that'd be very good if you can. Uh, you can write a very detailed narrative. But if you're not explaining, well, what are the problems that the agency had? You know, what about the exposés that occurred you know, with the church committee? What about Watergate? How did that affect? What about the end of the Cold War, et cetera, et cetera? You get into those things, and now you're addressing the question. Now you're explaining, look, at a series of things happened that weakened the agency's influence. Uh, operations that went wrong, etc. You have a series of factors, and you're explaining how those weakened the agency over a number of decades. Great. Then you're answering the question. But to simply give a narrative of facts is not enough. You've got to explain how and why things are happening. And the questions are always geared in that direction. So that's 40% of what you have to do. The next 40% is factual information. When you make the case that you're making, whether you're comparing things or whether you're explaining how or why things happen, you need to cite specific factual information to help confirm or support the answer you're giving. If you're going to say, well, look at in those two interventions, economics were really not an issue in Nicaragua because the U.S. had very little investment in Nicaragua at this time, whereas over in Chile we had a billion dollars worth of investment. The ITT Corporation actually went to the CIA and tried to pay them a million dollars to overthrow the government in Chile. I think there's good evidence of economic intervention there, whereas in the Nicaragua case there's, there's no indication at all that economics are important in stimulating that intervention. Okay, now we get some facts that support what you're talking about. 
And that's where the facts come in. Now, that you want to start with the analytical part and then go to the factual information to support what you're saying. That's the next 40% of the grade. The last 20% on the essay or essays has to do with composition. Is the answer coherently written? That means does it have a logical beginning, middle, and an end? Do you lay out at the beginning, very briefly, the major things that you're going to talk about and then logically go through? If it's a comparative answer, the logical thing is to say, wait, in terms of motivations, this is the motivation with Chile, this is the motivation with Nicaragua, this is how they're similar or different. Then these are the tactics, this is how they're similar or different. Logically progress through the main points. That it, then, when you come to the end, briefly summarize your conclusions. You know, that these were two operations that, despite the fact that they were both Latin American countries and occurred um, within a decade of each other, the fact is that, in many ways, tactics, motivations, etc., they were very different. By the way, if I ever ask that question, don't assume that that's the correct answer. I'm making this up as I go along. But the idea is that those are the pieces that give you a coherent answer. Now, as far as spelling and grammatical points, that is not the main focus. The main focus is to make sure that you can answer a question logically, that you can communicate clearly and coherently. So the emphasis is not primarily on spelling and grammar. If you make an occasional spelling or grammatical error, the grader isn't going to worry about it. Now, if you have serious problems in terms of spelling and grammatical errors that interfere with your ability to communicate, in other words, the grade is having problems understanding what you're trying to say because of spelling, because of grammatical you know, sentence structure that is incoherent, now you've got a problem in that area. But the main focus is to see that you can outline, present an argument in a coherent and logical fashion. Keep those points in mind, and you're in good shape. Now. One thing I always urge people to do is that when you get the exam and you look at the questions and you decide what question or questions you're answering, take five minutes and outline the answer. Even if it's just a series of one word, you know, objectives that you're going to write to. You know, these are the main things you're going to write about. You know, uh, he wants to know about the decline of the CIA. Okay, well, we'll talk about uh, the Vietnam War and how that affected it. We'll talk about the end of the Cold War. We'll talk about Watergate. I had seven or eight things that I've now listed, and now I can start writing. That way, you'll ensure that the answer is coherent, because you'll be following an outline. You'll be sure that you cover the key points that you wanted to cover, and you haven't forgotten along the way. And you'll be sure that you don't spend too much of your time writing about one or two objectives, that you now have forgotten the other five or six points. So if you just take five minutes to do that, you'll dramatically improve the answer that you give. Even though you've studied and prepared, take five minutes and outline the thing before you actually begin writing the answer. Now, in addition to that kind of preparation, I want to talk a little bit about using the materials in the course and using the resources. Whatever assignment you've got for reading, it's going to be a lot of stuff. Okay? Whatever I'm using, you're going to be reading a lot of stuff because I assign a lot of stuff to read. I think it's important that you read. It can give you a depth in terms of understanding issues that you just can't completely achieve through a set of lectures. The issue then for you is, I got to read all these things that he's given me to read, but what am I supposed to take out of it? The answer is, what you need to do is the following. If you're facing, well, I got a 300-page book over here that I'm reading, and you know, how much am I supposed to take out of this thing? It's 300 pages. You know, he only spent 150 minutes talking about this subject, and I got a 300-page book to read about it. The first thing to do is to read, whether it's a book that's assigned, an article, whatever, you have to go into it with a question in mind. 
as an academic, as a researcher, I spend time reading books and documents, et cetera, for the stuff that I write. But I always go into it. I don't go into it. It's not like reading a novel, you know, well, I'll start reading it and see what happens. You know, maybe it'll be good, maybe it'll be bad, maybe I'll fall asleep. I always go into it with the something I want to know out of this stuff. Uh, maybe I want to know what U.S. foreign policy was towards Vietnam in the 1950s or whatever. Okay, but uh, there's at least one major question I have in mind as I read this stuff. When you read assignments, you should have that same idea. Okay, he's got a, uh, an article on this particular intervention. Well, what are the kinds of things that he's been talking about in interventions? He talks about why the U.S. intervened tactics. So those are things that I should be looking for. Those are the kinds of questions that logically I should have in mind when I read that piece of material. So as you look at it, instead of just sort of reading through it and saying, okay, it's something to be processed in my brain, if you go into it with a question in mind that you know this something in particular or a set of things that you want to find out about, you'll retain a lot more for whatever reading you're doing. The next thing is, when you start reading this stuff, don't sit there with a pen or a marker and underline everything that you don't know. Because chances are you don't know anything about 90% of the stuff that you're going to be reading about, just because for most people, this is not the stuff that they read every day. You know, if somebody gave me a book on accounting and said, well, read the book and you know, tell us what's important in it, I'd underline everything in the bloody book because I know nothing about accounting. Okay, so everything seems important to me. What you need to do is read with the idea that I'll read, a, if it's a book, I'll read a couple of chapters and then try to summarize for myself. You can write it down or do it in your head. What were the main things that were covered in these chapters? or if it's an article, read through the article first, and then see if you can summarize, okay, what were the key points? One of the things that one of the assignments does uh, is try to make you do that, that there are some articles that you read, and then you have to answer questions about them, and the purpose of the question is really to get you into that mode of saying, okay, summarize what the key points were. Exactly what are the major things that this author was trying to say in this piece? That's what you should have in mind. And then, if it's a book, of course, if you can go back and take a book and summarize it, let's say you're doing handwritten pages, uh, and just say that you had maybe three or four sheets of paper and you wrote notes on that, that would be sufficient. I mean, you've done enough to try to summarize what the key points are. Because the questions are going to be asked in the exams are not going to be of the kind, and as you'll see in the syllabus, the syllabus has sample questions, or at least the current version does, to give you an idea of the level of questions that I ask. The questions you're going to be asked are not the kind of nitpicking, you know, well, exactly what did, you know, Dulles, you know, say to Eisenhower about Guatemala on this date? I don't know. I'm not sure I care either. It may be relevant, but most of the time it wouldn't be. But that kind of level of specificity you're not really going to have to take forward with you. Now, there may be some key fact that comes out in the book that, yes, you, you want to remember because it helps support a major argument. But most of it is simply trying to grasp the arguments that the author is making and to keep those in mind so when you're answering a question, you can use that material to more successfully answer a question that you may be asked. The idea is to get the larger picture out of the book or the essay be able to summarize it satisfactorily for yourself in writing or mentally and have a few of the key facts, just like with the lectures, that you can pull out to substantiate your interpretation of what the author was writing about. That's how to deal with the written material. So you don't feel like, you know, I'm overwhelmed. You know, you've got 600 pages or whatever it may be. You know, again, I'm making this up. Uh, don't go count the pages, but you're giving me 600 pages of stuff to read, and how am I supposed to get through all this, particularly when we're jumping all over the world? By looking at it and saying, what are the key points here, rather than letting yourself get lost in a lot of narrative and detail, go in with a question in mind and be able to summarize, once you've read the material or a portion of it, to go back and pull together the key points. If you can do that, you're in good shape in the readings. Now, as far as preparing for the exams, You'll find that after today, and particularly once we get PowerPoint stuff up on the screen, with each lecture, whether it's 
halfway through, after the first 75 minutes, or at the end of the entire session. Nine times out of ten, I'm going to give you some key points, emphasize certain things that I was trying to stress during the course of the lecture. Furthermore, the notes that will be up outline the lecture. So you get a very precise set of outline points that capture the key things that I was saying during that lecture. So instead of having to just sit there and say, well, you know, I sort of transcribed you know, everything that you said, but now I don't know which parts are important. If it doesn't appear on those notes, on that outline, it's not that important. Okay? Sometimes you know, I'll be giving you an illustration, you know, explaining something that happened between people. And it's useful, it's enlightening, adds some human flavor to what we're talking about, but it's not necessarily a key point. When we get to the interventions, as an example, at the end of every intervention, I'll go through and say, okay, here's what the historical crisis was in this country. Here's the key problem that helped trigger the U.S. intervention. Here are what some of the key motivations were for the U.S. These are the tactics that were used. These are the factors that affected the outcome. You'll get tired of this, but it gives you a coherent summary. When you get ready to study for the exam, the first thing to do is forget about opening your notes or the books and starting to just read through, okay? Because that's not really going to stick with you. On the other hand, if you start first and say, okay, what were the key points that he made? What did he think were the most important things about third world history, about the history of the CIA? And he talks about uh, why, for example, one of the key things that we'll talk about is why, given the fact the agency was created to gather and analyze intelligence, why did very quickly it wind up doing interventions as, a, as its primary business? Why did that happen? A whole series of factors that I talk about. You know, the types of directors, the influence of the OSS, uh, the Cold War itself, infighting within the federal government. We'll go through all these. But there's a series of such factors. You focus on those points first, then go and read the notes over. That will give you a structure. So it isn't all just like, you know, sort of pablum cutting, coming out of a baby's mouth, you know, that well, it all looks alike. Uh, instead, it's got some structure to it. I know these are the major things they want to talk about. He wanted to talk about, you know, what made the agency a covert operations agency, and then later, what caused the agency to have problems in the latter decades of the 20th century. I know those were two key things that he focused on. So all this factual material that he then provides about Alan Dulles and about all these other people, all of that now has some structure, and I can see the pieces that are worth remembering. Now, for example, Alan Dulles, he has a particularly strong influence on the agency's emphasis on covert operations, so I need to remember him. Okay? I need to remember the Church Committee in terms of the decline of the CIA because that was an important expose that occurred in terms of sort of uh, showing the agency's dirty laundry in public, etc. I know those things now out of this you know, set of notes that I have are important because I know the key things that he was emphasizing in his lecture. Start there. Start with the sort of superstructure, the outlines. Start with the key points that summarize, then go back and read the notes, then go back and look over the book again that you read, or the summary that you did of the book. And that way, you'll be well prepared for the exam. The sample questions that are on the syllabus are there because they're typical of questions that are asked, but I make no guarantees that that exact question is going to be, or any of those questions are going to be on an exam. The point is, it gives you a very concrete indication of what kinds of questions I ask. And of course, the kinds of questions that are asked are broad in general, as you will see when you see the sample questions. We're not going to be asking, as I said before, these highly specific, you know, uh, tell me what's in chapter two, footnote three, you know, who knows, who cares? But the kinds of questions they ask you to compare interventions, to look over U.S. foreign policy, uh, to examine 
the issues uh, of problems in CIA intelligence analysis, uh, not only in recent years, but back over time, a sweep of information and perspectives. Those are the kinds of things that you'll find in the sample questions, and those are the kinds of questions you're going to be asked. So you have to start with the big picture. You have to start with the broad outline if you're going to answer those questions successfully. And aside from the sample questions, you should be able to easily anticipate the questions that are going to be asked. I mean, one of the things about getting through courses in the university is to be able to anticipate the kinds of things you're going to be asked. You look at the syllabus, you know, you've got, what, seven or so interventions. Probably a good chance that you're going to ask a question on an intervention, right? You've got a structure to how each of those interventions is handled. So you have right there virtually a structure for a question. It's just a, an issue of, well, which countries is he going to plug in? Is he going to ask me to compare Chile and Vietnam? Or, but you can easily anticipate going down the syllabus. There's a huge amount of material on the development of intelligence operations in the United States and the CIA. That's another logical place for a question to be asked, right? So just going through the syllabus, you can anticipate because the questions draw logically from the syllabus. I never ask a question with the idea, well, at least 90% of the class is not going to be able to even anticipate my asking this question. You know, because that is colossally stupid. You know, anybody that asks you a question with the idea that they're going to demonstrate that you were unable to anticipate it is not trying to really teach. They're trying to show off or pretend that they can show off. So the questions are easily anticipated if you look at the syllabus and look at the major things that I'm stressing. And if you go through the lectures and look at the key points, you'll know which things are going to be stressed in those questions. That pretty much covers your needs in terms of what you need to be doing to prepare for exams. Now, the other side of the equation is that once you take the exam, the unfortunate thing is we're going to grade it and give it back to you. Uh, so you're actually going to have to get a grade. The most important part of that process is when you get the exam back, other than sighing with relief or cursing because things didn't work out so well, is reading the comments that the grader will make on the exam. Essentially, the way the exam will look is there might be some comments, you know, on the essay here or there, you know, written here or there, but at the end, there will always be at least a paragraph of comments about the essay. <coughs> Unless, of course, you've got an A. If you've got an A, there's not much to say except A. Anything short of that, the grader will explain why you got something less than an A. Okay. There's a lack of factual information here. The essay isn't well organized. It keeps hopping back and forth between time periods or going back to the same topics again. Uh, there's no analysis. You fail to compare the two interventions or whatever you are asked to compare, etc. They will explain to you exactly why you're getting a grade that's less than an A. And it's essential to read those through and take into account what's being said because the grading on the course is highly consistent. The people who grade for me have been grading for some time. I've been grading the same way for as long as I can remember, which is a very long time. And I can assure you, if you take one exam and the comment is, well, there was a lack of factual information, you really need a couple of major facts to support each significant point you're making, you take that into account and adjust for that in the final exam, I can virtually guarantee you, your grade will improve. Okay? Aside from the fact that you don't know what you're talking about, your grade will improve. It's very consistent. The graders go on that structure that I gave you earlier, 40%, 40%, 20%. Now, they're not going to sit there and say, well, you only got 35% of the 40% for analysis, or you only got... Those are relative weights. In other words, they know to focus on analysis and factual information, and then secondarily to look at composition, grammar, etc. 
those are relative weights. So they're not going to give you, you know, a score for each of those three areas. But you, but they know that that's the major set of criteria for their grading of the exam, and they will reflect that in the comments they give you. So there's a consistency here, so you can determine what do I need to do to adjust to do better on the next exam. Now, in general, and I direct this not so much to people in the live class, because you actually have me, you're so lucky, but people are going to be watching this on DVD uh, and tapes. You need to take advantage of the fact that there will be a teaching assistant uh, who's working on the course with me. That's because normally in any semester I may be teaching 500 students. Uh, chances are I'm not going to get to each of you individually. On the other hand, the teaching assistants are there, and this is particularly important if you are taking this, you know, as a tape or DVD course, because how much human contact do you get with the instructor or the grader? Not a lot. But the teaching assistant will be there to answer questions, okay? and it's important to take advantage of that. For people that are in the live class, you can just ask me. Yeah, that's easy. But if you're taking it as a television course, let's say, if you're doing it in that fashion, you need to take advantage and be in touch with the grader, the teaching assistant, if you have questions on the material. The grader, the teaching assistant, these people know the material as well as I do. Okay? So if you're having trouble sorting out, well, what's going on here in this part of the course or that section of the class, I didn't understand uh, this long discourse on historical background last week, you need to take advantage of that. And you need to communicate with the grader when you get comments on the exam. Again, this is something that people will naturally do if there's a live instructor in front of them that they can get a hold of uh, and ask questions and say, well, you said this. I don't quite understand what you meant about you know, that comment, why my exam wasn't that good, etc." They're far less likely to do that when it's a distance ed class being taught through television. You need to do it. You need to get a hold of the grader and the teaching assistant and we always do ensure that the exams are returned to you, the midterm exam, so that you can get a hold of the grader and be asking questions that you need answered so you can do better on the exam. The comments should be self-explanatory. They're not. You need clarification. That's what they're there for. Now, one other thing, and that is determining that you're in over your head. This is important because, again, this is a large university. Courses taught on television, it's very easy for people to lose touch. The biggest problem with taking this type of course, aside from, again, people who are taking it essentially in a live session, either here or off campus, is that it's very easy to say, well, you know, I got the DVD. I'll just watch it when I get a chance. Uh, if you have a live session you have to show up at, you're more likely to realize, you know, I missed the last two weeks. I'm pretty well up the creek here. But with a tape class, it's very easy to say, well, I'll get to it. I mean, I had a student call me last year, and we were, I think, about a week and a half from the exam. And they asked me, well, I haven't looked at any of the seven tapes yet. Do you think I have time to cover them? Probably not. Probably in 10 days, doing seven, you know, sessions at 150 minutes a session, taking notes and reading, you know, 300 pages of material, you're probably not going to be able to do that. And it's easy, you know, to let the stuff slip because, as I said, there's no sort of triggering mechanism uh, in terms of having to be at a live class. Aside from that, there's the chance that you're having problems. Even after consulting with the grader or with me, that you're still lost in the course. If that's happening and we can't help you, and we usually we can, either that happens, that happens rarely. More likely it's that, oh, God, I just haven't had time to keep up with this thing. That's fine. Point is, drop the course. And I say this, and it sounds, you know, silly that I should have to say this, but a lot of people just let this slide. I don't know that you're having a problem if you don't tell me. The grader's not going to know. But if you feel like, oh, God, I'm just you know, over my head here right now, I got too much to do. Fine, just drop the course, all right? Not a big problem. But for some reason, people will often hang on desperately. Uh, why not repeat it later? Particularly with TV classes, I mean, they repeat them 
most of mine, or most of these things are repeated every semester, and if not, at least once a year for most courses. So it's not like this is an opportunity I'm going to miss and never get again. If you feel like you're in over your head before you get to that first exam and get yourself into some real trouble, make an honest assessment. Have you kept up? Do you feel you have a reasonable grasp of the material? Fine, take the exam and go on. But if you feel like things are slipping away on you and you're getting into trouble, then if we are unable to clarify things for you or if you simply have not had the time to work on it, you know, fight the bullet and drop it while you can. Aside from the exams and the requirement that you actually read, as I said, there are homework assignments that focus on the readings themselves, at least as the course is currently structured. Who knows whether this will change. But as we have it currently structured, you will be answering some questions. Read the syllabus, and it'll tell you what to do specifically. You will be asked to answer two types of questions. One type of question are simply a set of IDs to identify persons, places, or things. What you need to do with those is to identify the person, place, or thing first. And most of these are fairly straightforward. Most of the time, you'll look at it and say, I know what that is. Even without doing the reading, you'll know something about it most times. I mean, if not in this class, but one of the others. Uh, Sigmund Freud. Everybody knows who Sigmund Freud is, right? He's the father of psychoanalysis. Fine. That's a good start. But then what you have to do is tie Sigmund to the document that he appears in. In that case, it happened to be uh, an essay that he had written an article about the Freudian slip. So you have to explain, well, this is Sigmund Freud. This is who he is. And he wrote this article about the Freudian slip, which is X. You know, it's this subconscious uh, idea that's expressed accidentally. Now you've both identified what this thing or person is and tied it to the document. That you can do in three sentences. That's what you have to do with the IDs. Very simple, straightforward, but just making sure people are reading the materials, getting the basics out of them. The second type of question that you're asked is an essay question about an article that you'll have read. However that question is phrased, what it's really asking you is to summarize the essay, the article. You should be able to do that in, say, a thousand words or so. People ask me how much? About a thousand words, 1,500 words. That should be sufficient to summarize any article. What are the main points? And what you're doing here also is practicing. I mean, this is the kind of thing you should be able to do for the stuff that you're reading, to sit down and say, OK, in a few pages I can summarize what the key points are. Yeah, uh, there's this article about uh, the early years of the Cold War and intelligence operations in the early years of the Cold War. Can I summarize that? What were the key things that the author was talking about? Can you do that effectively in a few pages? You can do that, then you're all set. Then you're at the right level in terms of gathering information from what you're reading. And that's the second type of assignment that you're asked to fulfill in terms of homework assignments. They are very basic. They simply are establishing that, yes, you're keeping up with the materials and reading the materials. And secondly, that you're at the right level in terms of being able to summarize what the key points are in the material that you're reading. Those are the nuts and bolts of the course, OK? Mm -hmm. In terms of your responsibilities for exams, homework assignments, and readings. If you keep up with those, attend, in this case, the lectures, watch them on TV when it's being broadcast. If you keep up, there's no reason in the world that you can't do well in this course. The key things are to keep up with the lectures, which provide the main guide. I mean, the main focus are the lectures. And then supplement that with the reading. There shouldn't be any surprises on exams. And there shouldn't be any problem in terms of the homework assignments uh, they're very basic summary pieces that you're being asked to do, whether it's IDs or essays, that guarantee that you've done the work and that you're keeping up with the material and are at the sort of right level of analysis. You keep up with that, you'll be all set. Again, it's not you know, rocket science. There is nothing uh, 
acutely analytical here. I don't teach the course with the understanding or the assumption that you have any particular knowledge about the CIA, about U.S. foreign policy, about the third world. My assumption is that the vast majority of people, and this has always been true, are taking this course simply because either they need to or uh, because they want to, and most people don't have any particular expertise in those areas. Maybe you do, that's great, but it, I don't teach the course with that expectation. So none of the historical background, none of the story of CIA uh, development institutionally, uh, et cetera, U.S. foreign policy, is based on any kind of assumption that you have any expertise or any particular knowledge of even U.S. history or third world history, et cetera. I'm assuming that most people just have you know, the basics of a good first two years of a university education, and we go from there. So there's nothing in this that you should find to be particularly daunting. If you can keep up with the lectures, keep up with the reading assignments, you should do fine. All right? Now we're going to finish up for now, bring this first session to an end, and then we'll come back in the second half and start looking at the history of the third world and see what the major factors are that give commonality uh, to the third world experience as much as we're also dealing with diversity in the third world because, of course, this is the primary environment that we're going to be involved in the social, cultural, political environment of the third world is what we're going to be dealing with through most of the course. So we have to start with some basic understanding of the diversity of the third world, but also what are the common factors uh, that have marked the experience of third world countries and how has that been expressed in their history, particularly since the end of colonialism in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and the emergence of third world nations, what are their key characteristics, and how has that affected their interrelationships with the rest of the world, particularly Western societies and the United States. But we'll come back in a few minutes after break and look at those issues. Thanks.